Hello, this is Vahakan Muradian, contributing editor at Marion West. And I'm glad to be in conversation today with Dr. Peter Borosian, mm -hmm. founding faculty member at the University of Austin in Texas, an advisor of the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, a philosopher, a longtime educator, and until recently, an assistant professor at Portland State University. Peter, welcome. Thank you for joining and taking the time. Thank you. Appreciate it. having me on. So you spent a fair amount of time recently on the air and in print discussing all the reasons why you um, why you departed from Portland State University to spare you the trouble of having to repeat any part of those conversations yet again. Would you just tell us briefly what you consider the the purpose of tertiary education to be and how exactly are American institutions falling short? Well, you're, 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 <laughs> I guess I can tell this is going to be an intense interview. You're just uh, leading with a, a first good shot. No, no light ball, no softball question there. Um, so I think that the, the purpose of the, of education, it depends, you know, K through 12 or college education, but the North star of education should always be the truth. What's the truth? How do we cultivate those in Greek, it's called doxa, you know, doxastic attitudes, those attitudes toward the truth, like belief revision, being trustful of reason. Those are constructs from the American Philosophical Association's Delphi report that's available online that I would really recommend that people at least look at so from the 1990, 1991, but it's just as prescient and important today as it was when it was published back then. And so the purpose of education is not merely to put in a skill set, but the whole orientation of the educational system should be around discovering the truth, finding the truth, being open to the methods that make it more likely that one will be less likely to be wrong. In other words, um, rigorous epistemologies, how we know what we think we know, engaging people in conversation, particularly people who maybe are heterodox thinkers or uh, who hold morally unfashionable opinions, holding conversations. I personally am not a fan of debates, but I understand their process in the educational system. So really trying to cultivate independent, thoughtful, reasonable people who are capable of thinking through problems and dealing with ideas if they don't agree with their preconceived moral opinions and giving them skill sets to do so. So previously, in conversation with Quillette's Jonathan Kay, you likened the, the American college classroom to, uh, to more of a, a catechism than Correct. a symposium. By this, uh, do you mean to say that colleges now operate on and subsequently habituate their students to faith as an epistemology as opposed to reason and evidence? Well, you, you have been uh, reading my work. Um, it's excellent. It's not that they use faith as an epistemology, but that they have systematically called out divergent opinions and, and people who hold those opinions. And if they haven't called them out, it's because they're too terrified to, to say anything. They've created a culture of fear. And so I think what we ought to be doing in these situations is, we, again, it gets back to the idea of creating a culture of value. Right. So, so there's a lot in your question. So give me the first part of your question and I'll try to speak to that. And the second part of the question, I'll speak to that, please. Well, there really is only one part to my question, which is, uh, which is the, what's, what's the dominant epistemology do you think on which the American college classroom now operates and teaches to its students? Yeah, I, is it moving away from reason and evidence in a way that it shouldn't? Yeah, I would think that the, I, I would, I'm not sure I like the question, but if I were to say what's the dominant epistemology, the answer would be standpoint epistemology. It'd be lived experience, <clears throat> excuse me, personal experiences used to adjudicate disputes in the world or what used to be, it's, 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 a, rad, it's a turn towards subjectivity. It's a radical turn towards subjectivity so that the subjective primacy of people's individual experiences are elevated beyond the testimony and evidence or excuse me, are elevated beyond evidence and reason. So it's the primacy of testimony. But I don't even think it's think of it in terms of epistemology. I think that there are just 
conclusions that are morally fashionable that people are told that they told students in particular, <clears throat> excuse me, that they ought to hold. And if they don't hold them, it's not merely, and Socrates talks about this, it, it's not merely that they, they don't have a piece of information, it's that they're bad people. And so it's this idea of forwarding certain conclusions and testing people and teaching people that those conclusions are true without ever having examined the other sides of the issue. A great examples of that would be, you know, trans issues, anything with an identity level salience, trans issues, um, almost anything coming out of the conclusions coming out of something ending in studies that the United States, gender studies, black studies, et cetera, that the United States is a, a, a patriarchal racist regime, things are not getting better, et cetera. Any disparity in outcome is due to systems, things like these, these kinds of conclusions, which are being forwarded. And there's no, there's no uh, uh, counter evidence or counter example being offered. This seems like a rather peculiar development for the American university. How, Correct. how do you think, this might be a very speculative question, but I'd be interested in your thoughts. Sure. How do you think a generally secular and irreligious and rather smart uh, liberal youth, and even more so in Portland, uh, in, in Oregon, I would imagine, than the rest of the United States, uh, how can they be so vulnerable to the, to the temptation and the false promise of moral certitude? Well, we, we all are vulnerable to that, right? We're, we're Steven Pinker talks about that, the Harvard psychologist. It's people don't act immorally. Nobody gets up in the morning thinking, thinking they're going to act immorally. It's because they're hyper-moral. They're, they have a kind of hypervigilance in the, the moral sphere that translates into their own sense of self-worth and what it is to be a good person and what it is to belong to virtuous communities and good people believe this. I want to be a good person. I am a good person. I believe this. And so I think in the case of Portland, what you see with the, that's a different kind of situation because it's a cascading systems failure. That's a failure of the, the mayor who is to be rather blunt a disgrace, a failure of the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, of uh, the big sort, it's called when people of uh, um, different. Uh, well, let me let me frame, let me let me um, phrase it this way: likes go to likes. And when I was growing up, my parents had demo. My parents were hardcore working class Democrats, but they had Republican friends. Uh, one one of a, a green friend, a conservative friend, all kinds of friend, Christian friends, atheist friends. But we don't see that. We see people sorting out now in, in, in terms of their ideology and their belief systems. And in Portland, it's even worse than that. I mean, I never see a Trump bumper sticker. I'm in Washington now, and I see tons of Trump signs. Trump, even now, the election is, is Biden's been in what, for how long? But so I think you see divisions in Portland where um, people have sorted themselves out into ideological camps and you just don't find any conservatives. One of the things that, that, that is a consequence of that is it becomes normative. Everybody believes this, good people believe this. We don't see any people who believe that. And it's very easy to other people. But Portland is, is not doing well now at all. And I think it's the lack of intellectual diversity is one of the, one of the, the reasons for that. Does that answer your question? Certainly it does. And it sounds like uh, what you mean to say also is that that lack of intellectual diversity is reflected on campus. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. So the, we know where the nucleation point of the madness is. We know that the, the universities have specifically called out professors and made who don't subscribe to the morally fashionable or toe the orthodoxy. For example, they they didn't they don't even want people to learn about certain things. Like they took a, a Bruce Gilley. He's the he's now the most he's now the most hated man at Portland State University. Um, they didn't allow his course in conservative political thought. Um, they rejected it, and they said it's because it doesn't have enough diversity. And so they don't even want people to hear certain ideas because they believe that those ideas have no, no business in the larger marketplace of ideas. And so you have distinct problems that are isomorphic to each other or have a relationship to each other. And that you have the problem in the university system, in the Oregon system in general, in Portland State in particular, the calling out of intellectual diversity 
and the kind of a homogeneity, but you also see that manifested in the larger uh, city of Portland. How would you respond to the following, maybe slightly Marxian proposition? The catechistic college producing ideologues more so than critical thinkers contains, is pregnant with its own contradictions and its collapse is a matter of time. Probably, I probably agree with that. I don't think that this ideology is sustainable. Um, I think you have a terrible system. This is a much bigger question, but you have a question of legitimacy from Jürgen Habermas, I think it's 1973 piece, which is translated as legitimation or the legitimacy crisis. You have a crisis of legitimacy where people don't trust bodies of scholarship. They don't trust vaccinations, for example. They don't trust evidence. They don't trust experts. So we've created a crisis of legitimacy, but the folks who have created this are first and foremost academicians. And then that's spilled out. We have a crisis of legitimacy and venerable uh, institutions like the New York Times, the SPLC, NPR is a big one. And so I, I don't think that the ideology is sustainable, both because people don't trust the institutions where, in the case of, for example, Portland State University, or it doesn't have to be there. In fact, it's not only there, it's, it's ubiquitous in the English speaking world. That you have ideologues who have jobs for life, they have tenured positions, and they're forwarding moral conclusions. And I don't think that that is inherently sustainable. You, you can't base, you have, if you want a system that's legitimate, then you have to, in which people trust, then you have to make systems capable. You have to make systems worthy of people's trust. And that's, that's also what the postmodernists get backwards. It's not just relationships uh, are, a truth is mediated through power and, um, we, we have to change the way that people look at our systems, but we have to do that by fixing those systems. And first and foremost, you need some kind of intellectual diversity in those systems where you have to have some corrective mechanism of people pushing back and students are getting the, the, the um, to hear from professors who have different beliefs and different views. And maybe those views are controversial and maybe those views don't always tow or, or, um, Maybe those views make some people uncomfortable, but that's what an education is. You know, the, the purpose of the education isn't to have your own beliefs reinforced when you go in the classroom, right? That you learn in K through 12. The person is to, the purpose is to, to learn the tool sets so that you can be less likely to be wrong. But it has positive epistemological ambitions as well in education. You know, how do we figure out what's true? How do we converse? Can, how do we solve social problems? How do we those are secondary and tertiary, but you know, how do we uh, ameliorate human suffering? How do we make uh, societies and construct systems that are that are that not only have North as their true star, but also hopefully do do some good along the way? So these are reasonable questions, but the only ways that those questions can be answered is if you have some kind of either a countervailing narrative or facts and opinions, people who actually believe as Locke has uh, um, talked about people who actually believe um, propositions that don't accord with the dominant moral orthodoxy. Mill, I'm sorry, not Locke, Mill. So I've heard you elsewhere. That, make, that, that was a long answer, but did it, did it make sense? It was long and comprehensive, I appreciate it. Okay. And if uh, I just heard you have a solution. Yeah. If I let me just say, if I say anything that's unclear or just goes on, just just let let stop me, and I'll I'll try to do a better job of explaining. I won't let you get away with it. Good. So uh, that's good. Um, besides um, trying to fix present institutions, as you mentioned, as in an attempt to to try and reverse or perhaps pre prevent a future crisis of legitimacy, I think you've also mentioned the possibility of of parallel institutions of Correct. essentially starting anew. Uh, you are a faculty fellow at the University of Austin now. Correct. So how do you imagine the evolution of that institution differing from that of the traditional college? That's a, great, that's a terrific question. So the first part of the question was the parallel institutions. And so I think it's really, really important it's very easy for me to sit here and complain and point out pro problems. There are more than enough problems that I can point out, um, but that that's insufficient. You have to build, right? You have to make, you have to offer viable alternatives to people. 
University of Austin is an alternative. I'm not saying it's the solution to anything. I'm at, in fact, I'm saying it's not the solution to anything. There's not one single solution to the problems, the legitimacy crisis or what have you. Ralston College is another one. Um, the University of Austin has been very explicit, very explicit that they the relentless pursuit of truth is the goal of the institution. And so if somebody has a, a view that doesn't accord with the majority, like for example, Kathleen Stock is a, Ayan Her CLE is a founding faculty member. And she's written some rather um, um, strong books about women in Islam and infidel. And um, so somebody, and Kathleen Stock is another founding faculty member who's written about women's only spaces. And so we need to create cultures in which um, ideas are engaged in, as the Christians would say, you know, good faith. We look at the evidence, we plumb people's epistemology. We try to figure out if they have good reasons for believing what they do. And then we forward the value of belief revision, right? If, if someone knows something we don't know, then I, I don't know, I wanna know it too. But you can construct institutions around these core principles. And right now, this is almost the exact opposite of the institutions in which we currently have. They've been hijacked, they've been prestatized by an invasive value that was simply not, not even in existence 10 years ago. Oh, did I lose you? Oh, no, we're here. We're still live. Okay. Um, and you've written quite a bit, by the way, on education and the Socratic method. Um, both of your books, in fact, have a pedagogic character. Will right. you be teaching as part of your involvement at the University of Austin? And if not, what does a post-teaching academic career look like for you? Good, good question. So yes, I will be teaching. I'll be teaching in the month of uh, June. And so the, the first sequence they're going to offer is forbidden classes. And so what I'll be doing is I'm going to go in at the beginning of each class and talk about, you may hear ideas, so people have no infrastructure for this. So I'm going to talk to people, talk to students about, so you may hear ideas hear how to ask that you're offended by or you find you know what whatever however you find this dyspeptic or something um so you 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 there are better ways to engage those questions there are better ways to plumb people's epistemology there and what do you do if you're offended etc so here are how to ask socratic questions here's rapaport's rules here's how to repeat back to somebody what they said to figure out if it's true here's how to handle a conflict Here's how to, it's X, Y, and Z. Um, so nobody's being tossed into the deep end. Everybody's been being given a template for how to deal with controversial ideas or ideas that um, they may find unpalatable. And so that's part of what education is. It's not to reinforce the beliefs that people came in with. It's to help them figure out what's true by giving them tool sets. And inherent within that tool set is being explicit about those attitudinal dispositions, which will help them achieve what they're seeking. So this is a positive epistemological ambition as well. So that's what I'll be doing in June is I'll be going in those as of the caveat in all of these conversations in 2022 COVID permitting, I'll be going into the classroom and teaching those initial uh, classes for two hours before the, the the professors come in and I'll also be meeting with students and talking to them about you know publishing and career ambitions etc so I'm really I'm just super excited about it it's just it's it's a dream job your latest book co-written with James Lindsay is in fact on that very subject right on having difficult conversations with those with whom you potentially disagree fundamentally uh, why, why should one pursue and go through the efforts of having those conversations rather than, say, uh, humiliating one's ideological opponents in debate and doing what one can to encompass their destruction politically, morally, rhetorically? Well, if you, if, if you want to live in a society like Iraq, then you probably shouldn't. But if you want to live in a society that's um, in which we're trying to help each other, in which we're trying to find the truth, in which we're trying to ameliorate human suffering, as I said, and increase everybody's well-being, 
then the, the only way to do that is through conversation. It, you know, the, the alternative is a bloodbath. The alternative is violence. If you want to make systems better, you have to start talking to people with whom you disagree. There's just simply no alternative. The, uh, the dozen or so hoax papers that uh, you and several co-authors managed to somehow uh, place in peer-reviewed journals, uh, papers that is of complete nonsense, uh, was that meant to start a conversation or to prove something? If so, then with and to whom? Uh, it was meant to point out the problem of the corruption of scholarship. And uh, we published something on Ariel Magazine, AERO, that details that specifically. The next wave of that was Cynical Theories, the book published by Pitchstone Press. Helen was the lead author on that. And that's to, so it's first was pointing out the problem. Second is explaining the problem with the Cynical Theories. And Helen has two more books, I think, coming out from Pitchstone Press this year, 2022. They should come out, but there's been a supply chain issue with paper and books, et cetera. And the third problem, the third uh, plank of that, if you will, Helen started counterweight. And counterweight is how to help people who have been adversely affected by critical social justice ideology. So it was kind of a sequence. Excuse me. Well, given the, um, the hysteria and the rage with which uh, many administrators and, and editors and other scholars responded, to the, uh, to the revelation of the hoax. Would you consider that, that, that the effort backfired, that it didn't start a conversation, in fact, one that you hoped oh, it would? No, no, no. well, certainly I, 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 I would have hoped, and maybe this is Pollyanna, to think that in retrospect, that some people would say, wow, geez, okay, maybe there's a problem here. Maybe we should look into this process. Maybe, there's something else at play, maybe that there's a corruption of scholarship. No, and I think what it did when it pointed out the problem is many people who had no idea of this stuff. And remember, we were discovered prematurely by the Wall Street Journal. If not, we would have had time to prep the public for the implications of this. So the reporters saw what the, the journal editors did not see. And so that started a wider conversation, which, which uh, again, then led to, you know, now we can see it all around us, but it led to elements in cynical theories. In fact, if the Wall Street Journal had intervened, maybe uh, you'd have been associate professor of philosophy before. Uh... Uh -huh. Yeah, if, if the, well, no, then not, not that would never be a good thing. But if the Wall Street Journal hadn't intervened, then for sure we would have had, not only would we have more papers, probably, you know, 13 or what have you, but those other papers would have been in the literature. Um, we would have had more time to explain to people in videos, normal people like who, who are tuition payers, basically, this is, this is what's happening in the academy. And this is kind of the rabbit hole that, that folks have fallen down. This is a consequence of a, of a bunch of things, one of which is not having intellectual diversity. The other one is extending the confidence and the belief beyond the warrant of the evidence. And I've, you know, written about this and I've, I've published about this. Uh, I wrote a piece in the Philosopher's Magazine, Diluted Departments. I've published about this pretty extensively. I think that this is, this is a problem that both uh, points to the crisis of legitimacy in our institutions. And it points to the fact that, that we have to start, I do not believe, and there's a schism among people who believe this, I believe, for example, with my friend Neil Ferguson, that their you know, institutions are irredeemable. Like, I don't think Steven Pinker and other folks believe that. And so that's the other reason why it's important to build alternatives to the existing educational infrastructures. You're very fond of the Greek concept of parisia, or unfettered and honest speech. Uh, a concept that you mentioned a few times in recent conversations and in your in your work. Uh, what do you mean exactly when you apply the term to our context, like when you discussed it with Barry Weiss in September? And why is it important? Yeah, I've, <clears throat> I've spoken about why. So you do know my, my work. Yeah, I've spoken about that um, ex pretty extensively at this point. In my, my talks in London, I spoke about that. It has a long linguistic pedigree. You know, you can find it in Acts 413. You can find it in... Uh, rabbinical um, 
um, writings and even model, modern scholarship. Uh, Foucault talks about it extensively. So, uh, it, you, so again, if you if you if you uh, look at Foucault's writings, *Fear of the Speech* and the the, uh, <clears throat> the Courage of Truth* and um, uh, *Discourse and Truth* and the Problemization of Parisia, and and those are that's a, an audio lecture. So. You know, I'm certainly not the. I've tried to popularize this idea, but but uh, this idea ha has an extensive pedigree. So what I mean that by that is honesty in conversation, speaking boldly, speaking boldly specifically when there's a concept of danger involved, and that's something we we've lost kind of an honest, blunt bluntness in our conversations. That also, again, we could take this line of thought in many places right now but that's what i mean by that and that's the only that's the thing i think is the solution to much of this current derangement that's affecting western civilizations being honest speaking truth in the face of danger uh that's also one of the things that's that's killing our relationships is that we've created cultures in which people are afraid to say what they mean and if you don't say what you mean and i don't say what i mean to you then not, not only will I not know what you mean, but I won't even know what I mean. So we're not forming a relationship that's authentic. We're forming a relationship on the basis of what we think the other person means as opposed to what they actually mean. That's the other consequence of creating these particularly academic structures in which people are not forthright in their speech. Does that answer the question? Certainly, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, Foucault, Michel Foucault, the French, um, Postmodernist thinker, who I think mentioned Parisi, or talked extensively about it in a series of lectures in the 80s, perhaps shortly before his death. Do you think that this interpretation, that is the, the Foucauldian um, interpretation of Parisia, might be the, the origin, the intellectual origin of now fashionable notions like speaking truth to power, like lived experience being so central to, to reasoning and to arguments um, and to other oddities like like one's truth being different from another's it's a great question a uh, yes and no the the um there has to be an element of danger in parahesia um and th there is almost no element of danger when you speak about your lived experience in a society which has elevated that to um to be the arbiter or the adjudicator of disputes so yes and no or perhaps many who, who do fashion themselves as biosiastes, as, as people who do speak freely and, and honestly, do also think that they are in danger when they do so. Uh, but beyond that, um, I think in the original Greek formulation of the term, the, the person, the, the biosiastes who does speak freely and honestly, doesn't just have the moral virtue of, of earnestness, of sincerity, but also all the intellectual and moral virtues required to know the truth. Correct. Not correct. just to speak it. Yeah, um, correct. There does seem, sorry, I interrupted you, go ahead. Well, uh, please, if you have a thought that responds to that, go ahead. But my question is going to be the, I think the necessary corollary, which is if, does it mean that unfettered speech is really impossible for the, for the ideal student, one who, uh, is always open to changing one's mind and is never convinced of having reached the edge of knowledge? Yeah, there's a lot. That uh, question is pregnant with things. There is somewhat, at least my conception of people have done their intellectual homework and they've considered counterexamples and they've considered arguments against their own position. Um, inherent in one of the main thrusts of my work has always been the importance not just of giving people a critical thinking tool set to, to help them more reason, or reason morally and solve problems, but to give them, as I mentioned before, the attitudinal dispositions like willingness to revise one's belief. That is now again to been, been um, extirpated from the existing university system in which we're told that there are certain moral truths. The uh, bodies of literature, which are more or less invented whole cloth that masquerade as you know, knowledge seeking true scholarship, people pull from those bodies of literature to form moral conclusions that are in accord with the moral orthodoxy. So it's a difficult question because um, 
it does assume that, well, let me get back to this. So the main thrust of my work has been how to forward those dispositions like willingness to revise one's belief and why that should be a value and how that should factor into the creation of systems. And that also goes back to legitimacy crisis. So if, if it's almost a prophylactic against uh, believing nonsense. And so it's not just moral certainty that's, um, that's the problem here. And it's not just extending the belief, <clears throat> excuse me, the confidence and the belief beyond the warrant of the evidence or how tenacious one is, uh, or that um, believing something with moral certitude makes one a better person. You know, I am a, a man of conviction. So like, for example, when I hear I'm a man of conviction, I just translate that in my head as I'm a person of conviction. I'm a person who um, is immune to evidence, who doesn't revise my beliefs on the basis of evidence. So inherent within that notion uh, you know, that Greek notion is you've kind of done the homework, but I think it's really important to also forward the notion that you, you want to revise your beliefs on the basis of incoming evidence. And you're, I mean, that's what science does, right? And so there's often a confusion about something. Oh, we're, you know, 98% certain that global warming is anthropogenic. In other words, increases in temperatures are attributable to uh, you know, carbon, and human action. And people will look at it and say, well, look at that, you're only 98% certain, but that's how science works. And the, similarly, there's a cognitive and epistemological process of disconfirmation in philosophy called defeasibility. You always have to have some, some room to revise your beliefs, right? So this is not theology, this is formulating your beliefs on the basis of evidence, and you have to leave enough wiggle room so that are enough uncertainty in your beliefs so that more evidence could come in that would cause you to change your confidence. Because if you're always certain of something, then you're not formulating your beliefs in the base of evidence because there has to be some, some um, space that new evidence could come in and that would cause you to revise your confidence. So to me, when I think of, of those Greek notions, parousia, speaking truth in the face of danger, boldness in one's speech, that also has to be bundled with this idea that you're willing to revise your belief on the basis of sufficient evidence. But in order to do that, you would have to know what that evidence is and be, uh, be receptive to that and create institutions in which, I'm not a fan of debate, but you know, conversations, <clears throat> debate if you have to have them, so the pr problem with debate, just parenthetically, is that people hunker down and they want to, you know, show that something, th they're less likely to revise their belief if they're debating because they don't want to lose. So we can have conversations about a lot of things that we're debating now. I'm not saying debate doesn't have its role. In the, it, 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 I think it does have a role in the, in the institution, et cetera. But I think conversations are much better. So Okay, now leaving that parenthetical back to the original conversation, I think that part of that, those notions are coupled with attitudinal dispositions, and they have to be. Does that make sense? Is that answer clear? Yes, I appreciate that answer. Um, in fact, when it comes to debate, perhaps the value is more for the audience than for the participants. If they can see the best, the most vociferous version, the most vehement defense of an argument, being made against any and all challenges, then then the audience ultimately becomes the their beneficiary. Yeah, and even that. So that's right. That's why I said I'm 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 not opposed to debate. And if folks want to debate, that's great. They the the one thing that's important about that is that everybody agrees upon the rules of engagement. And now in the cultural world, we see people don't in agree upon rules of engagement. So when two people are debating, they'll try to deplatform someone or shut someone down or bring a bullhorn in or scream from the audience. And there are more than enough videos of events I've done where people have pulled out the speaker wires because they don't think any, they think they have, they're so confident they have the truth. They don't want to quote unquote platform. You know, they have a, a whole linguistic infrastructure for this as well. Um, so it's not that that it's not that debate. It's not that there's anything wrong with debate. In fact, debate can, in certain circumstances, be good. But we can often solve the problems of of whatever we're trying to think, whatever problem we're trying to work through. We can also we can often solve those 
through conversation as opposed to people being so wedded to not losing that they're not willing to revise their belief. I think that sends the wrong message. Understood. And to reinforce something you mentioned earlier, especially if we are in a community, if we're operating in a community that is trying to improve its common lot, and there's there ought to be a common understanding uh, that we're all aiming towards the same benefit. So um, yeah, mutual and, trust is essential. Yeah, and inherent in that is one of my core beliefs is that if you want to figure out problems, reason, rationality, and evidence is indispensable. And we can figure out better. There are some types of life, lives that are, lead, that are better to lead than other types of lives. And the way that we figure that out, we can rationally derive those. But in order to rationally derive those, we need a kind of a resisting opponent, if you will, to borrow a term from, from martial arts. I just read Matt Thornton's manuscript and writing a forward to it now. It's called The Gift of Violence. And he talks about this. You need some kind of a corrective mechanism, some kind of resistance. And conversation, uh, debate offers that as well. But hearing, thinking about, seriously considering, reading, even podcasts, if you want, even YouTube videos, but just letting those ideas in so that you can carefully consider those is, is just essential when you're trying to figure out what's true and lead a better life, a better life for you, a better life for your community. The best way to do that is to be more humble about what it is that you think that you know. And one of the ways to do that, to cultivate that doxastic attitude is to expose yourself to people who have different beliefs than, than, than you is, is to, uh, is to, you know, if you're a big MSNBC man or, or, or OPB or NPR, try to listen to, to news on the other side. Just try to expose yourself to a wide, read books, for example, of things you wouldn't agree with. Um, and that's one of the ways that you can cultivate a more humble epistemic life. It, you can also clean up your epistemic hygiene, if you will. I think John Stuart Mill creeped up again in... Uh in that answer, uh, in his various experiments of living, I think is a term he uses in, in On Liberty and, and why it's important to allow those experiments to occur. They're not primarily valuable to the person doing the experimenting. Uh, they are valuable to everybody else observing that experiment. Correct. Because after it, they'll know either a, a better way of living or will be, or will receive a confirmation that theirs is superior. Correct. Correct. And that's also why you asked about the University of Austin. That's also why it's really important to have people teach things who actually believe it. So, for example, in my when I used to teach at Portland State, I, uh, I'm, I'm an atheist. I make no, I don't hide that at all. And I realize that I am limited. I can present arguments for the existence of God, but I simply don't believe them. And so that's why I had people come into my class. I had Corey Miller, the president of Rottio Christi, come into my class. In fact, we went on tour together in Utah, and we were going to have a larger tour, but then the pandemic hit. But uh, I think the tour is like a Christian and atheist argue for intellectual diversity. He came into my class. Uh, Philip Phil Smith, who is the president of the or the the chair of the philosophy department at um, George Fox University in Oregon, he wrote a very lovely letter to the Oregonian. Maybe you can you can please, if you don't mind, uh, put that in the YouTube link about when he came and spoke to my class. Um, I would always try to have people, I've had um, Mark Sargent from the Flat Earth Society. I don't believe the earth is flat, but I had him come into my science and pseudoscience class, which is the perfect class for him to come in. Um, I have a rather unorthodox view about aliens. I think we're alone in the world, but I had um, Nick Pope come in to talk about uh, aliens and living, you know, UFOs, et cetera, et cetera. And the key thing there is not just that these people came in, <clears throat> but that they, that the students were allowed to ask them questions. But, I, but it's not only, again, that students are allowed to ask them questions, but you have to teach people how to ask better questions, how to ask Socratic questions, how to plumb someone's epistemology, how to figure out what someone is arguing, what do the terms mean, what is the evidence for this, how do you weigh the evidence, and then they can use that when they hear the best representatives of those arguments, they can impose a kind of Socratic method on themselves and think, okay, 
Is there sufficient evidence to warrant belief in this? And if there is, should I believe it too? And, you know, belief isn't binary. It takes place on a, you know, on, on a scale, like we're more certain of some things than we are of other things. But the key to that is we have to create educational institutions in which we have people <clears throat> who are sincere inquirers who are allowed to ask genuine questions, especially if those questions buck the moral orthodoxy. You know, for example, a big one is should uh, trans women be allowed in women's sports? I think that's an important question. Here's another one. I think that this, if we weren't, if our society wasn't held hostage to some kind of, I don't even know, some kind of cultural sickness at the moment, the idea of uh, um, mandatory vaccines would be a fascinating one to have a genuine, honest, and sincere conversation about. But we're not having those conversations. It's extremely polarized. Neil Ferguson's book, Doom, talks a little bit about this. Um, but the key, again, to all of this stuff is honest inquiry, trying to find truth, creating institutions that value truth, um, trying to figure out, um, giving people a tool set, not only to have those conversations, but to engender certain doxastic attitudes, willingness to revise your beliefs, trustfulness of reasons, two, two of those I talked about, and then trying to figure out what the best way is to live in a society with people who have different views and, and beliefs. And right now, the exact opposite thing is being modeled in the university from what we need. And you asked before about the University of Austin. And one of my hopes is that, and I'm very confident at this point, uh, that we can have those sorts of conversations at the University of Austin where we simply cannot have those at other institutions. And we can I allow certainly hope people- yeah, we can allow people the cognitive liberty to believe whatever they want to believe without imposing uh, sanction or punishment or castigating people if they don't believe what we think they should be, what they should believe. Yeah, I certainly hope you can replicate that that exercise at the University of Austin. Um, seems like you're the right person to do it. Um, and I appreciate that. I'm trying. I'm trying. Well, in the meanwhile, uh, while you're in the process of trying that, do you also intend to continue uh, publishing academic work? That is, should we and journal editors around the country be on the lookout for critical perspectives on various parts of our anatomy? <laughs> the conceptual penis is always rising up in these interviews. Um, I don't I don't know. I'm working on a children's book now about a young Socrates who roams the countryside and has conversations with people or it's called the young adult um the age group and he formates a, a rebellion against uh, tyranny etc so I, I don't know what what uh what is in store for me in terms of publishing we'll see uh to be very blunt with you the this young adult book is far more work than, than i thought it would be but i'm i'm more i'm working on i'm working on that i don't know if i'll peer-reviewed publish or peer-reviewed pieces i don't know if i'll I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. You know, I'm 55. I, I'm in an interesting position in my life right now. I think Socrates would agree. That's the, that's the peak of your, of your abilities. Yeah, I, th I think so. I, I, I enjoy it. My problem is that I'm somewhat of a slow writer, uh, but I'm also doing some videos. I'm trying some different things. I'm, you know, writing, I just wrote a screenplay with a, a buddy of mine. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. But I think that the, th the, the important thing is that, I would like to, you know, my dad passed away and I told me, make sure you leave the world better off than when you, you came into it. And so one of the lodestars of my belief is what Dan Dennett calls abiding significance. What I write, when I try to produce something, I think, okay, is this something of abiding significance? Is this going to last? Is this going to help people? And I think if you do that, if you create something of value, then people will value it. And if you if you really, um, yeah. So anyway, that's what I'm working on, trying to create works of abiding significance. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. But that's what I'm aiming for. Well, that sounds like great advice. And far be it from me to to gain say the advice of a of, a, of an Armenian man. Uh, I, I should say we should all be, be following it. Um, Peter, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me today. My pleasure. Uh, whenever your, um, your young adult book is published, or just before, in fact, 
do drop us a line. We'd love to review it for Marion West um, in great. advance. Um, and uh, thank you once again for joining. Uh, good luck with all of your future endeavors. And we hope to speak again soon. Thank you. Thank you. You can find me on Twitter at Peter Bogosian, B-O-G-H-O-S-S-I-N. I'm on Substack. I'm, I'm all on the getter. I just found an account. So uh, yeah, find me there. And I appreciate the conversation. Thanks so much.